hello students. It is Monday, November 8th. I'm making this little video update for JMS 494. And um, I hope you like the black and white uh, imagery. I kind of feel like I should be having a cigarette right here, a big thick lucky stripe with big plumes of smoke. Uh, but anyway, um, thank you for everyone who responded to the discussion board post from last week about the movie, Good Night and Good Luck. Uh, I like that movie a lot. Um, I just have a couple of comments to say about it. Oh, uh, it was very interesting to me that so many of y'all uh, felt compelled to point out that it is in fact a black and white movie. Uh, one of my favorite comments from the discussion board was, uh, overall, I liked the film, even though it was in black and white. And Hector said it was, uh, probably his favorite black and white movie. Hector, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, there are plenty other black and white movies out there that I think you will appreciate as well. Um, there's a many things in the movie that relate to what we have been discussing in JMS 494. Uh, Marco uh, pointed out that the film shows, and this is why I put this film right after the last module about electronic media regulation, that there are many rules and regulations that affect the way broadcast companies can operate distinct from print. You know, a traditional print newspaper does not need a license to print, but a radio or television station does need a license. Um, so Marco picked up that, you know, we're a free country, we have the First Amendment, but there's a lot of things that affect the way electronic media operates, uh, including, you know, uh, pressure from sponsors, which we do see in the movies. Uh, the one thing that really struck me, though, uh, based on what most of y'all comment about was that uh, many people uh, faulted Murrow for being biased, that Murrow had a bias and was out to get McCarthy. Um, and, you know, I agree that he had a certain agenda, but uh, I do not believe that journalists should be stenographers. I repeat, a journalist is not simply a stenographer. Uh, stenographers are those people from court who write down everything that's being said. Um, if someone says it's raining outside and then someone else says, oh, it's not raining outside, I don't think it's appropriate for a journalist to simply say, one person says it's raining, one person says it's not raining. Stick your head out the window and tell the public, is it raining or not? When you repeat and report false information, you are just amplifying propaganda from someone who's putting it out for uh, evil intent, right? Um, so uh, I think that uh, when Murrow and Fred Friendly decided to take on McCarthy, yes, they definitely had an agenda, but I think they were ultimately serving the public good. I do believe they were ultimately serving the public good because the things that McCarthy were saying were blatantly false and had no there was no factual evidence to what they were saying. Uh, Andre and, and uh, his discussion board post noticed this, uh, and I'm quoting, um, this film and the real life context behind it serve as a convincing reason why news sources should not practice the fairness doctrine, okay? In short, Clooney paints CBS a highly regarded news source, which is true as an ally of the people. Uh, they simply don't report what public officials are saying Again, that's being a stenographer. Instead, CBS maintains a critical eye so citizens don't have to fear political power. Um, so anyway, that's my position. That's my position on it. Um, so that's the way I feel that, yes, we do teach objectivity uh, in the school and we do teach uh, presenting both sides of the story. Uh, but when one side has no factual basis, I, I don't really feel that journalists are obligated to give that uh, substantial airtime. Um, Christian also pointed out something I thought was interesting. Uh, he, uh, Christian quotes, um, while giving a speech at an event, Murrow uses the opportunity to address what he sees as the nation's built-in allergy to unpleasant or disturbing information, and that uh, contemporary television is mostly used to distract and insulate the American public rather than being used to teach, illuminate, and inspire. Um, and then there's a parallel here made in Christian's discussion board post about uh, 
Murrow's speech still resonates today as several popular mainstream news outlets like CNN and Fox News still occasionally prioritize entertaining the public with trivial news stories over reporting more important or controversial topics. Um, and I think that's true. I think news, because it's based on advertising and it's based on eyeballs, does have a tendency to trivialize uh, issues and report whatever is you know most silly. Uh, the classic example of this, if you don't know this, the classic example of this is when local news stations bring you the story of the water skiing squirrel. You know, like uh, there could be some horrible things going on in the world, but hey, we've got a water skiing squirrel. Here's a clip of the water skiing squirrel. They're becoming one of Florida's most famous water skiing couples. Today, Twiggy and Ollie attracted the National Enquirer to their hometown of Sanford. Inquiry minds want to know why two talented squirrels are so popular. Ollie's got more outgoing personality and Twiggy's more introverted. But um, other than that, um, they're both squirrels. I also want to mention uh, Daisy, Daisy Hathaway. Uh, she wrote, and I thought this was a nice paragraph. She wrote about, um, uh, you know, sort of the concerns over communism and the ways people's uh, privacy was violated uh, relates to the uh, Patriot Act, which was passed after 9-11 because the government wanted more information, wanted to find suspected terrorists. And since the cooling of the post 9-11 hysteria, hysteria I don't, this is Daisy's post, Americans have begun to question whether they are comfortable with the idea of the government having the power to search through our private communication if they merely suspect someone of being related to a terrorist plot. Um, and I think this is true. I think that you know many things have been done uh, under the guise of national security, which are really just uh, violations of people's privacy. Uh, my wife, I think I've mentioned I assume I've mentioned, you know, my wife is Pakistani. Uh, most of her close family now lives in the United States. But after 9-11, uh, every one of her male cousins who was a teenager or, you know, in their 20s at the time, every one of her male cousins was visited by the FBI. Uh, oftentimes, the FBI would show up with like a binder, a binder of like, you know, the last seven years of AOL messages printed out. Um, AOL was big at the time. You know, maybe there was some concern about terrorism, but it's also kind of troubling that what if someone dug up the last six or seven years worth of your email and the reason these young men were being targeted was because they were Pakistani, uh, they were communicating with people in Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, India, other Muslim countries. Um, I mean, India is not a Muslim country, but, you know, they have family in India. Just the idea that if you're communicating with people in these other countries, you're suspect, that's a little concerning. Um, anyway, so uh, I, I think most of y'all who watched the movie enjoyed it and understood some of the nuances and difficulties with objectivity or what we call objectivity and also some of the issues with the fairness doctrine. You know, you have to present or in the past, you did have to present two sides of a story, but, you know, maybe there weren't really two sides of a story and who determines what is controversial and what is not controversial. Um, this week, uh, the topic is about obscenity. There's a video lecture, a reading from perusal. And I also posted the story just as kind of an additional update because I thought it was interesting. Uh, the little baby, now a grown man, who was on the cover of Nirvana's fa famous album is now trying to get money from the band or money from the record label. Uh, one, because issues of obscenity and you know potential child pornography his genitals are exposed if you've never seen that album cover yes his genitals are exposed but it also brings up issues of like licensing and, and use of a private individual's likeness and you know I, i'm not going to say one way or the other what i feel about that case but uh, I, I did find it very interesting that that case kind of broke uh, while I'm teaching this class on law and ethics. Okay, that's it. Keep up with Canvas, all right? Thank you.